A thousand years from now, we want to tell people what's important about our time, what inspired us, and the only way that we can communicate that to the future is by preserving these things and making sure that they're passed on to the next generation along with the significance that we attach to them. This is President William Howard Taft's 199 white steam car. It's a Model M 40 horsepower steamer. This car matters because it marks an historical moment. On March 4, 1909, William Howard Taft brought this car into the White House, and because of that act, the automobile industry, American political culture, road building, and the whole economy that is built upon this changed to be the way it is today. If Taft had ridden a horse on that day, things would have happened differently. Taft's idea about bringing a car into the White House was based upon his absolute love for these things. He loved speed, he loved the idea of, of outrunning the press and the Secret Service, and they were always upset. You ate my dust was one of his favorite expressions. The original chauffeur, George Robinson, tells a story about when they'd be driving through Washington, D.C., and the press, the people would be all around, and when things would get a little bit too crowded, he wanted to play with them, he would hit the release valve and steam would come shooting out underneath and go straight around and send everybody running. Taft, I know, must have thought that was the funniest thing ever. So he had this sense of real true joy about the machines, but he also knew this was going to be beneficial to all Americans, and he wanted to put the presidential imprint upon that. As Taft comes into the presidency, he's negotiating with Congress to fund the White House fleet. And Taft already made up his mind. He wanted a white steamer. Why a white steamer? Because in the Army they had been testing with him. It's from his home state of Ohio. It was quiet. The steam car sounds like a big sewing machine which is kind of ironic because the white company started out as a sewing machine manufacturer. It's a very particular technology. And you had a chauffeur who knew how to run the steam car. You boil water, it pushes the pistons, and that drives the wheels. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, this car has an incredibly complex engineering to it. This car can cycle through the water so that you don't run out. It's got coils that boil so you're not boiling water in a pot. It's a very, very beautifully designed car. And it's not exploding like a gasoline engine. It goes ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. it doesn't go ka -ka 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 -ka. It is a car that we feel so privileged to have here at the museum. At the time when gasoline cars, steam cars, and electric cars are being made in the United States, I really look at this car as the shining example of what was possible with steam vehicles. I'm imagining the first time this thing was put in the White House stables, soon to become garage. They fired up. The pride they must have had in this is just so amazing. It's not just any automobile, it's the president's car. Before the Taft presidency, cars were something that's scary to people, it's exciting, it's new, but the political class doesn't want anything to do with them. How do you justify yourself as representative of the people in a $10,000 automobile? Taft is not concerned with this political aspect of ownership, and he now is using what Roosevelt called the bully pulpit to promote things such as golf, baseball, and automobiles. What a statement that would have been to say, this is the beginning of the automotive era. And as the leader of the country, I'm going to proclaim that by making a significant investment in motor cars and leading by example. As president, he's showing the rest of the political class in DC, you too can own a car. The first thing that happens in Congress is the Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader of the Senate want their own cars. And automobile registration in D.C. goes from being one of the lowest for a major metropolitan center to the highest in the country per capita. Everywhere he goes around the country, he's seen in an automobile. He's in the newspapers. He's in people's vision. Imagine 1909, a United States president coming to Kansas. This is a lifetime event. You don't flick on the TV and listen to the president. You go and see that president, and you see him step off the train and get into an automobile. All of a sudden, you know, wow, I want that too. You have an explosion of interest. The industry nearly doubled from 1909 to 1910. From there, the growth is exponential. This is the vehicle, literally, that Taft rode through and into history. What I love about the white steamer, first of all, is its imposing size. It's not a car that you casually walk up to. It really has a, a sense of royalty about it because of its size, and you want to stand up a little straighter. I love the seal. I mean, it's so important. This is the presence of the United States. This belongs to the people. George Washington understood he needed to be presidential and be seen in a formal horse and carriage, but this just takes that idea and amplifies it. Cars and our presidents are so intertwined, and it all started with 
William Howard Taft sitting here as chief executive, running this as his mobile Oval Office. There's this great story that how Taft brought in the majority leader of the Senate, sat him in the back of the car on a cold day in March and told the chauffeur to drive faster. And Senator Aldrich said, okay, can you put the top up? Taft said, no, we don't put the top up. We take in the air. And Archie Butt grabbed a sweater that was underneath the seat. It wrapped twice around the Senator's body because it was Taft's sweater. By the end of the ride, Aldrich had come to agree with Taft. Yes, I'll, I'll promote your legislation, Mr. President. Let me out of here. Taft's got a Republican platform that he needs to put into law. Roosevelt is now freed from that platform, so the two of them separate politically. They love each other, they're brothers, up until their political differences get in the way, and those differences are severe. So in 1912, Roosevelt starts the Bull Moose Party and runs as an independent candidate. And this is when the progressives leave the Republican Party and end up in the Democratic Party. This split starts with the Republican candidate, Taft, riding in automobiles, and the progressive candidate, Roosevelt still campaigning in ox carts, trying to be the friend of the farmer. As he left office, he was very explicit about why the car is gonna be beneficial to the public. He gives a speech in front of the Automobile Club of America, and he told these wealthy people how rapidly we adapt ourselves to the absolute necessity of those improvements of which we knew and imagined nothing 50 years ago. I'm sure that of all of them, the automobile coming in as a toy of the wealthier classes is going to prove the most useful of them all to all classes, rich and poor. He knows now that this is no longer an instrument of the elites. This thing has now changed people's lives. I don't think very many people stop to think about how impactful the invention and adoption of automobiles was to almost every single aspect of American culture. He deeply impacted the nation through this automobile, and I just feel indebted to him for what he did. I'm Michael Bromley, and this car matters. <laughs>